Good afternoon, everyone. How's everybody doing today? Anybody blessed to be in the house of the Lord? Amen. Well, will you stand with me as we honor and reverence the reading of God's word? We're going to turn to Judges 6. Judges 6. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Aaron Rios. I am the pastor of Wogam Espanol. Shout out to our Wogam Espanol family. Um, pastor's not here. Um, and so he is at mu- he's taking some much needed time away. And so he, he deserves it. I, I, I'm, I'm humbled and honored to be able to stand in his place behind this pulpit. Uh, I, don't, I don't take this lightly and I have very big shoes to fill. But, but nevertheless, I'm, I'm honored. And, and pastor, we just wanna honor you right now in this moment. Can we just honor our leaders, our pastors of Wogum this morning or this afternoon for everything they do and that their strong leadership. We love you guys. Um, so I, I've said this before and I'll say it again. Uh, if I say something that doesn't make sense, it's the Hispanic in me. Uh, if I say something with a country accent, it's the Southerner in me. And if I say anything good or noteworthy, that is just Jesus in me. So I hope that this message blesses you and encourages you. Um, we're gonna start in Judges 6. You, got, you guys there? Amen. Judges 6, verse one. Let's read verse one. It says, and the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Midian seven years. You might ask, why, why, would, why would God do such a thing? I, I thought this was God's people. Why, why would he do that? But Proverbs 3, verses 11 and 12 say, my son, do not reject or take lightly the discipline of the Lord. The Amplified says, learn from your mistakes and the testing that comes from his correction through discipline, nor despise his rebuke. For the, those whom the Lord loves, he corrects, even as a father corrects his son in whom he delights. And Hebrews 12, verses, verse seven echoes what Proverbs 3 says. It says, you must submit, the Amplified says, to the correction for the purpose of discipline. God is dealing with you as sons. For what son is there in whom his father does not discipline. I don't know if you remember being younger um, and, and being whooped or being spanked. And, and, and in times like those, you have our parents saying, or my parents at least would say, I'm doing this because I love you. And it wouldn't make sense, right? It wouldn't make sense in that moment, but it wasn't until all of us were older that we were mature that we understood that this discipline, this correction was for our good. And so in this chapter, in this verse, God delivered the Israelites into the hands of the Midianites because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord and, and, and because he wanted them to turn back to him. In the middle of this oppression, in the middle of this affliction, God was saying, I need you to know who to come back to. I need you to remember who to come back to. And so verse two, it continues and says, in the hand of the Midianites, prevailed against Israel. And because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made them the dens which are in the mountains and caves as strongholds. And so it was when Israel had sown that the Midianites came up and the Amalekites and the children of the east, even they came up against them and they encamped against them to destroy the increase of the earth till thou come unto Gaza. And 3,000 years later, they're still facing the same enemy. It's just it's this, the same enemy, but with a new face. And what does it say? And they left no substance for Israel. Verse five, for they came up with their cattle and their tents, and they came as grasshoppers for multitude, for both they and their camels were without number, and they entered into the land to destroy it. And Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites. Let's jump over to verse 11. And there came an angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord appeared before uh, Gideon and sat under the oak, which was in Ophrah, and that pertained to Joash, the Abyssalite. And his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, the Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. And Gideon said unto him, oh my Lord, if the Lord be with us, then, then, then why has all of this befallen on us? I can imagine Gideon in this moment saying, God, if, you, if you're really with us, why is it that we've been handed over into the hands of the Midians? Why, why is it that we're having to hide in dens, hide in caves, hide in mountains? Why is it that there's no sustenance? Why is it that Israel is greatly impoverished? Why is it that I'm having to hide while I'm threshing this wheat? Gideon was at a breaking point. And I don't know what your why is today. I don't know what you came in here with. I don't know why you're asking God, why am I dealing with this? I don't know what your why is today. But I'm believing 
and declaring that this breaking point in your life is going to become a breakthrough in the name of Jesus. Can you believe that with me today? Amen. Well, let's pray and then we'll get into it. Heavenly Father, we just thank you that you're in this place. Holy Spirit, thank you for moving, Father, in the hearts and minds of your people. Father, I, I, I pray, God, that you would anoint me right now, God, that you would use my mouth as an instrument, God, that I would be used right now as a vessel, God, and that the people that are under the sound of my voice would receive what you have for them, Father, and that they would leave this place differently. Father, we lift up your nation. We lift up your people. We lift up Israel, Father. Your word says that we should pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They prosper, they that love thee. And so, God, we just speak peace over the, the nation of Israel, God, a peace that surpasses all understanding, Father, on the, on the families, God, that are affected by this war. And God, we just thank you, Father, that you're placing a hedge of protection over your people, God. We pray that this word would bless us and that we would leave encouraged, Father, and, and challenged, Father. I pray that for myself in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. Turn to your neighbor, give them a high five, greet them if you feel like giving them a hug, tell them welcome to the house of the Lord. Amen. So I just wanted to give a quick shout out to our Bozier campus. Those who are watching us across the river, can we give them a shout out? Amen. Those that are also watching through our live feed, thank you for connecting with us. Let us know in the comments where you're watching from. We'd love to, to connect with you. And so let's get into it. So before the prayer, we, we talked a little bit about Gideon and the Lord, how he appeared before Gideon after seven years of, of Israel being oppressed by the Midianites. And Israel was handed over to the Midianites because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. And God appears to Gideon and, and with, with this assignment in, in the middle of his breaking point. And we talked a little bit about it, how, how Gideon was, 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 was breaking. And, and so let's, let's start at verse six. And we'll go on from there. Verse six says, and Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. And it came to pass when the children of Israel came un unto the Lord because of the Midianites, real quick, just to pause, isn't it, hasn't things remained the same? Isn't it like us that we only go back to Jesus whenever, whenever something is going wrong? We cry unto the Lord only when something is going wrong. And so the, the, the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. And it came to pass when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites, verse 8, that the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, which said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought you out of Egypt and brought you forth out of the house of bondage, and I delivered you out of the hands of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all that oppressed you and drave them out before you and gave you their land. And I said unto you, I am the Lord your God. Fear not the gods of the Amorites in whose, whose land you dwell in, but you have not obeyed my voice. And so in other words, God was using this prophet to say, hey, your, your disobedience has brought this consequence upon you. It's, it's, it's really you who did this. I'm only allowing this moment to correct you. I'm only allowing this moment to get, get you straight because I need you to know who to come back to whenever you're afflicted. I need you to come back, know who to come back to whenever you're in need, when you're lacking, when you have no sustenance, when you're being attacked, when you're being afflicted, when you're being oppressed. I need you to know who to come back to. And this is where Gideon is introduced in the story. So verse 11 says, And the angel of the Lord, the Lord himself, appeared unto Gideon and sat under uh, an oak which was in Ophrah and pertained to Joash the Abyssalite. And his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said, Thus uh, the Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. And Gideon said unto him, oh, my Lord, if you, if you were really with us, why, why has all of this befallen on us? We continue reading. It says, and where be all of his miracles, which our fathers have told us of, saying, did not the Lord bring us from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us and, and, and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. And, and the Lord says, and the Lord tells him, I am with you in this, oh, mighty man of valor. I want to go back to that in verse 12. Isn't it like the Lord to call something that is not as if it, though it were? And he called Gideon into this moment. He called him in a breaking point. 
And Gideon had no idea what was about to take place. He had no idea what was about to happen. But God said, I've already seen the end of your story. I've already seen what you become. I've already seen how I work through you. I've already seen the, the end of your story. And the Lord is telling you that today. I've already seen your story. You might not know what, 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 what tomorrow looks like. You might be lacking. You might be struggling. You might be oppressed. But the Lord says, I already know your story. I already know what's about to come. And so there's hope. And so... Gideon tells him, our, father, our fathers have told us all about you. They, they've told us how you've driven us out of Egypt. But well, where have you been? Where have you been, Lord? And isn't it true that we focus more on today's loss rather than yesterday's triumph? And Gideon's focus was victim-minded. He was at a breaking point, and, and he thought that the Lord had changed his mind about his people. Let me remind someone today that God has not changed his mind about you. He loves you. He cares for you. He has not left you nor forsake you in this breaking point. He's the same God of yesterday, today, and forevermore. James chapter 1 verse 17 says, There is no variation in the Father of lights, the creator and the sustainer of heaven, in whom no rising or setting or shadow cast by his turning. He is perfect and he never changes. He loves you. He is mindful of you today. And rest assured that if he's brought you out of something before, he's going to bring you out of it today. He's going to bring you out of it again. Verse 14, and the Lord looked upon him and said, go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent thee? And he said unto him, O my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and, and, and I'm the least of my father's house. And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with you. I will be with thee. And thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. I'm reminded of what our pastor says all the time. That God can do anything in your life that you won't take the credit for. And, and we'll talk more about that in just a few minutes. But if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. Your obedience will provoke opposition. Your obedience will provoke opposition. So the Lord commands Gideon to tear down the altar of Baal and to build an altar to the Lord. You can read about it in verses 25 and 26. But if you continue reading, the men of the city investigated who did such a thing, and they were out to kill him. They found that it was Gideon. They found that it was Gideon that did this, this thing, and so they went after him. And let me tell you that when you're obedient to God's voice, rest assured you will be opposed. So what do we know about opposition? Word of God, what do we know about opposition? Opposition is just opposed position. There is an enemy that is going to want to restrain you. There is an enemy that wants to see you oppressed, that wants to see you not walking in the blessing of the inheritance that you've been engrafted into because of the blood of Jesus. He wants to see you defeated but it's time for us as children of God to rise in our calling, to rise with valor, with confidence, knowing that greater is he that is with us than he that is in the world. Amen. If God be for us, who can be against us? So if you study this chapter, you see that Gideon was afraid. Who wouldn't be afraid if they were in the same position? Let me tell you that anyone that is advancing the gospel, the kingdom of God is going to face opposition. You don't have to be working in ministry. As long as you're preaching Jesus, as long as you're uh, advancing the gospel, the message of Christ, you are going to be opposed. You're going to face opposition. And I just want to testify a little bit real quick. Before I stepped into ministry, before I stepped into this role, I, 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 was, I was attacked spiritually, uh, first mentally, and then it was spiritually, then it was physically, then it was emotionally, and, and, and it started with my addictions, it started with my relationships, they were affected, I was anxious, I was depressed, and I, I got to the point that I wasn't eating, I wasn't sleeping, and, and it got to the point where I asked God, like Gideon, hey, God, if you're really with me, why is it that I'm dealing with such things right now? God, why is it? That, that I feel so alone? Why is it that you're not with me in this process? But the Lord had purpose in my life long before I knew it. And this, the same is true for you today. A short time later, it was revealed why I had to go through certain things, why I had to go through a certain process. God was telling me, I want to take you somewhere, but your mess can't come with you. And the same is true for you today. Maybe the Lord wants to take you somewhere, but he's saying, I want to take you something, but somewhere, but your mess can't come with you. 
The Lord had something, the Lord had purpose in my life long before I knew it, and he has a purpose and a calling for you long before you know it. And if there's anything good in my life, if there's anything praiseworthy, my wife, my family, my baby, it is simply because the goodness and the mercy of God in my life, and it wasn't anything that I have done, it wasn't anything that I could have achieved in my own efforts, it is simply the goodness of God. Amen. You better be expecting opposition whenever you are obedient to the voice of God. If you're not ready to face opposition, then you're not ready to be used by God. I'm gonna say that again. If you're not ready to face opposition because of your obedience to God, then you're not ready to be used by God. And the enemy will want to remind you of your past in those moments, but it's in those moments that you have to remind him of his future. If you look at this chapter, the minute of city, they, 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 when they realized that it was Gideon that tore down the altar of, of Baal, they, they changed his name to Jerubal, which means Baal. Let Baal fight against him. And can I tell you today that the enemy is going to want to put labels on you. The enemy is going to want to make you think you are something you are not. But your identity doesn't come in what others label you. It doesn't come from what others have said of you. It comes strictly and only from the blood of Jesus that was spilled on Calvary. Your value comes from the blood of Jesus. That's good news today. Not what others have said. Not what others have, 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 have spread rumors of. Not what you've done in your past. No, you're worth the blood of Jesus. Chapter 7, turn there with me. By this time, Gideon was getting his men ready for war. They were preparing for war. Now, before this took place, uh, I believe Gideon tested the Lord three times. He, he wanted to make sure, if you look at the story, he, he was like, God, I just need to make sure that you're talking to me. I need to make sure that, 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 that you're going to use me to deliver the Israelites from the hands of the Midians. I, I just need to make sure, God. I just need to make sure. And the first time he does that, he, when, when the Lord appears to him, he says, Lord, if it's really you that's talking to me right now, it's, if it's really you, let me come back. Let me come back. Let me just bring an offering. Let me just confirm that it's really you that's talking to me. And the Lord said, all right. And responded, he stayed there first time. The second time, he said, okay, Lord, if you're really going to use me to, to deliver the Israelites from the hands of the Midianites, Lord, I'm going to put fleece of wool on the floor, on the ground, and, and let, the, let the fleece be wet. Let the fleece be wet and let everything else around it not be, not be wet. Let it be dry. And the Lord responded. He said, okay, I'll do that. He did it. And the third time, Gideon says, you know what, Lord, please don't strike me. Don't, 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 don't smite me. He's like, Lord, this time do it opposite. I just need to make sure. I just need to make sure. If, you, if this is really you that's going to use me to, 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 to deliver the, the Israelites from the Midianites, let, let this fleece now be opposite of what I just said. Let the fleece be dry and let the floor around it, let the ground around it be wet with dew. The Lord responded, and he did it as he requested. And I love this next part in chapter 7, verse 2. The Lord said, all right, Gideon, I responded to your request. Now it's time for you to respond to mine. Verse 2, it says, and the Lord has said unto Gideon, the people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, mine own hands that saved me. If you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. Breaking points predict a breakthrough. Breaking points predict a breakthrough. So the Lord was telling him, you know what? You know what, Gideon? You've got too many people in this army. I don't want you or anybody else take boasting in what's about to happen. I, I want everything, everything that comes out of this, I want it to come back and point back to me. I want to get the glory for all of this. So you, you see that, that if, if you study the story in chapter 8, verse 10, you see that there was 135,000 Midianites, if you know the story. There was 135,000 Midianites and a total of 32,000 Israelites. 32,000 Israelites. Now, I don't like math, but I was curious about the percentage of what it would take for Israel to, de to defeat the, the Midianites. And I was just, I wanted to see the percentage of what it, what it took, what it, what it was. So you've got 132,000 Midianites, right? And then you've got 32,000 Israelites. And so I looked at the percentage and, 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 and they had a 23.7% chance of winning. 23.7% 23 chance of winning. I honestly consider these initial numbers Gideon's first test because the odds were already stacked against him. And so in verse 3, it says, Now therefore go to proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from the Mount Gilead. 
So, so the Lord says, Gideon, 23% is just too much. I don't want them to boast in this. And so the word says that 20,000 Israelites left, meaning that there was only 10,000 Israelites remaining, 10,000. And here's what I believe to be Gideon's second test. So now we have 10,000 Israelites versus 135,000 Midianites. It, 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 honestly, you look at that number and it just doesn't make sense. You and I would have probably gone home with those 20,000 that left. So let's do the math again. So 10,000 versus 135,000. So Israel had a 7.4% chance of winning against the Midianites. And the Lord said it in verse four, and the Lord said unto Gideon, you know what? 7.4 is just a little too much. The people are, are too many. Send them out. I'm, I'm gonna test them real quick. I, 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 Gideon, take them to the water. And depending on how they drink water, depending on how they drink water, those are the ones that you're going to, going to set apart. So, so the word tells us that there were 300 that drink water a certain way. So, so uh, the, the Lord says, have them look at how they drink water. Look at how they posture themselves. Whoever laps water into, put their, puts water into their mouth like a dog does, th then those are the people that you're going to select to go with you. I don't know if you've seen a dog drink water in slow motion, but a dog's tongue kind of just cups the water and brings it to its mouth. And so in, in other words, they, they were in position. They, they, they postured themselves and they said, okay, let me drink some water. Let me drink the necessary substance that I need, but I'm also going to be vigilant. I'm also going to be alert. In other words, God was saying it was all about posture. It was all about posture. And it reminds me of the story of Nehemiah when Nehemiah was sent out to rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. And it says that they were mocked. They said that they were threatened. But, but what does the story say? That they were rebuilding with one hand and they were, and they were ready to fight with another. They had a weapon on their other, on their other hand. And so in that, in that moment, in that, their mentality, they were saying, you know what? We're not gonna let your mocking deter us or keep us from rebuilding this wall. But look, if you're ready for something to pop off, we're ready too. We've got a weapon on our our hands and we're ready to fight it was all about posture in that moment and, and and going back to the story of Gideon they were postured they knew that they had an enemy that was ready to attack them they knew that they could that, that they could come at any time but they were on guard they said no I need this I need this substance I need to drink this substance to, to be hydrated to be prepared to know what I what, what I need to do to, 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 to continue moving forward for the strength that I need but you know what I'm gonna position myself to be aware to be vigilant because I know that there's an enemy out there that is ready to kill, steal, and destroy. His word is our substance. His word is our substance. We need to be daily in this word, meditating day and night because the word is a substance. But hey, we're going to put on the full armor of God and we're going to be vigilant in case the enemy wants to try something. We're going to be ready with the sword of the, of the word of God to fight back. Can anybody say amen with me? God was saying it was all about posture. The posture you take during your breaking point determines the position you have after your breakthrough. I'll say it again. The posture you have during your breaking point will determine the position you have after your breakthrough. So in verse 7, we read that we have 300 men that remained for Gideon's army. 300 against 135,000, which I believe to be Gideon's third and final test. 300 against 135,000. I don't know about you, but outside of the will of God, that is certain death. So, so let's do the math again, all right? So you've got 135,000 against 300. So now they have a 0% chance of winning against these Midianites. I know we've got some mathematicians that are going to say, well, actually, a 0 0.22222. We're talking whole numbers right now. There was no chance. There was no chance that the Israelites could have defeated the, the, the Midianites. There was no chance. And I don't know if, there was, if there's anybody in here that can testify that there was, of a moment in your life where there was no chance absolutely, where there was just no possibility, where there was just no way but God made a way where there was no way I don't know if you can testify this morning of the Lord doing that for you there was no chance what the Lord was saying I want to get the glory for this in the end and anybody say but God but God the Lord will do anything in your life that you won't take the credit for so that he gets the glory at the end of it all it matters how you posture yourself in a moment of breaking. 
It matters how you posture yourself. I wanna tell another testimony. My mother-in-law uh, recently went to Mexico and, and every time she goes to Mexico, she, uh, she uses that time to see family, but she uses that as a moment of, of, of a mission uh, to, to preach the word, to bring the word to someone who hasn't heard about Jesus. She will give out free Bibles, free Christian CDs, and so she'll take that moment to minister. And my mother-in-law is just built different. She's just, you know, she doesn't like to bother anybody. She's just always up and moving. She doesn't like to bother anyone, especially when she's sick. When, when she's maybe tired or maybe whatever it might be, she doesn't like bothering anybody. She'll still make herself busy. I don't know if there's any, anybody that, that, that knows someone like that. But uh, she never likes to bother anyone whenever she's sick. She always makes her so busy. And so a sickness, an illness came upon her while she was in Mexico. And, um, and because she never likes to bother anybody, she texted the entire family to say, hey, please come and see me. And so in other words, we... This was new to us, this was different. We knew it was serious this time. And, and so we, we, we kind of prayed for the best, but we're expecting the worst. And so my baby girl and, 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 and Yadi went up to, to see her uh, in Mexico. And during this time, there was several months that passed, she was on a treatment. She was on a treatment that, that caused terrible side effects, terrible side effects. And, and after months and months of going back to going back to this, this hospital to, to make sure, just to kind of update, she finally went back to get her test results. And before she could get the test results, before she could open them, she took the time to say, can I pray over these test results and can I pray over you right now? So in other words, she put her health aside to preach someone, Jesus. And I don't know about you, but in that moment, I would have been like, give me my test results. Give my test results. No, but she said, she said, no, I just, I just, need, to, I just need to pray. I just need to pray over you. And, and she said, it doesn't matter what these test results say. God is still worthy. God is still worthy. And I want to remind someone today that it doesn't matter what you're facing. God is still worthy of your praise. He is still worthy. And to testify, when the doctor uh, opened up the, these results, she said, I've got great news for you. We couldn't find anything. We, we, we couldn't find nothing that was bothering you. The, the bacteria that was affecting you is completely gone. And that's only for the glory of God. Why do I say this? Because it matters how you posture yourself in a moment of, break, in a mo moment of breaking. Because that determines the position you take after your breakthrough. Amen. Amen. You have to know. You have to know and you have to be reminded that you will face opposition because of your obedience to God. But it's that obedience that releases God's miracles over your life. And those around you, they can't help but say, this was the Lord's doing. It was nothing that I could do. It was nothing that I could have done in my own strength. It was simply the Lord's doing. And Gideon was looking at his weakness. He was looking at his weakness and he said, I don't know if I can do this, God. But God said, no, my power is made perfect in your weakness. And through my power, it is only through my power that you get the victory. Amen. I want to, to, uh, for you to write this last point. Breaking points require greater faith. One more time. Breaking points require greater faith. So Judges chapter 7, verse 9. It says, And it came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, Arise. Tell your neighbor, Arise. Get thee down unto the hose, for I have delivered, thee, delivered it into thine hand. It is time for us as the body of Christ to arise. Tell your neighbor again, arise, arise. It is time for us to rise up as people that aren't ashamed of the gospel, that aren't ashamed to testify of what the Lord has done in their lives. We need to advance the kingdom of God on this earth and not be ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God unto the salvation of first the Jew and then the Gentile. We cannot be ashamed. It is time for us to arise. The word says that he has delivered the enemy into our hand already. And perhaps 
the, the enemy looks in, innumerable. Verse 12 says, And the Midianites and the Amalekites and the children of the east lay along the valley like grasshoppers for multitude, and their camels were without number as the sand by the sea. Your, your, your circumstance, your sickness might, might be great. It might be big in your, in your sight, in your perspective. But don't tell God how big your problem is. Tell your problem how big your God is because he is greater than any opposition that you could face. Amen. It's time for us to arise. Amen. It doesn't matter how big the, the, the opposition looks. It doesn't matter how, how, how big the number is that, that, that come against you. Uh, I'm reminded of the story of, of Elijah and his servant where, where King Aram sends his soldiers to capture Elijah, to kill Elijah. And they were surrounded. And I don't know if you've ever been in this place, but, but Elijah's servant was, was afraid. He said, oh no, oh no, what are we gonna do? What are we gonna do? And I don't know if you've ever been in that place. Like you don't know what's gonna happen. You you don't know what tomorrow looks like. He was like, I don't know what's going on. I don't know what's about. Oh, no. And Elijah said, Elijah said, God, open his eyes so that he may see. And I pray that over myself and over you th 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 this afternoon, that your eyes would be open to see that greater is he that is with us than he that, it is, in the, that is in the world. Amen. God tells us in his word that the battle does not belong to us, but the battle belongs to the Lord. And in his grace, in his mercy, he calls it our victory. So if it's his battle, why would we waste energy on, on a battle that isn't even ours? You don't have to know all the details in this process. You don't have to know everything. You don't need to know what tomorrow is going to look like. You just have to trust him in that process. You just have to trust him. He's gonna give you the grace that you need day by day. Listen, posture is our responsibility, but the result is God's responsibility. Posture is our responsibility, but the result is God's responsibility. I want you to read verses 18. We'll jump over to 22. They were about to get ready to praise. They were about to release a sound. And in verse 18, it says, when I blow the trumpet, and when all that are with me, then blow ye the trumpets also on every side of all the camp and say the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. They were getting ready to release a sound of praise. Verse 22. And the 300 blew the trumpets, and the Lord set every man's sword against his fellow, even throughout all of the host. So, so, the, so they, they released a sound of worship. They released a sound of praise. And what did this do? It, it confused the enemy that they started attacking themselves. They didn't know what to do. Did you know that you have a weapon named praise? Did you know you have a weapon named praise? So what does this weapon do? Weapon, the, the, the weapon of praise is an expression of our faith and a declaration of our victory that we have in Jesus. But also, it releases God's power over your circumstance, over your life, over your family, whatever it is, whatever sickness, whatever illness. It releases God's power over your life and it confuses the enemy. It confuses the enemy. When you praise God it doesn't, it, with a mentality that it doesn't matter what I'm going through. It doesn't matter what I'm facing. It doesn't matter what the challenge is. It doesn't matter what I'm lacking. I, I'm going to praise God and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to bless his name because he is still worthy. That is when God unleashes his power over your situation. And we have to have a mentality that our praise won't be conditional. But it's going to be constant because he is worthy. No matter what we face, God is still worthy of praise. And even though you're in the middle of the battle and you don't see the victory, you might not see the way out, you might not see your healing, you might not have had your family come back or your relationship restored, but God is saying, I am powerful and, and I can control this. I can, I, can, I can deliver you from this. I can restore this. I can free you from this. God is powerful to do that. When you start praising in the middle of breakthrough or even after, in the, in the middle of breakthrough, even before your breakthrough, you unleash God's power and it confuses the enemy. Have you ever walked into a room and, and, and you walk into a room with, with something that's on your head? You, you, you're going in there, I'm gonna get my keys, right? You go and then you're like, wait, what I, what I come in here to do? Have you ever had a moment like that? Some of you had a moment like that this morning. <laughs> That's how I imagine the enemy coming into your life to try to steal, kill, and destroy, to try to mess some things up. He'll walk into your life, and the moment you start praising, he'll be like, what I, what I come in here to do? What I come in here to do? Because when you start praising, 
before the battle, or even in the middle of battle, it unleashes the power of God and it confuses the enemy. Listen to this, Gideon and his army, they praised, they released the sound, they worshiped before they got the result. But why is it that we always worship after we get the result? Galatians 3, 29. It says, if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs to the promise. So because of Jesus, we were engrafted into this promise that God gave Abraham in Genesis 12. If you haven't been here on Wednesdays, I strongly recommend that you bring yourself and a friend. Pastor's been talking about uh, of this topic. And so we, we initially weren't God's people. We were engrafted into this promise because of what Jesus did on the cross. We weren't Israelites. We weren't Hebrew. We weren't God's chosen people. We were engrafted simply because we put our faith in the blood of Jesus. And, and so when, when you look at the genealogy, when, when we, the, the word says in, in Galatians 3, 29, if you belong to Christ, if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed. And, and pastor has talked about this, how we can trace our genealogy back to Abraham. So you've got Abraham who begot Isaac, who, who begot uh, 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 Jacob, and then the 12 tribes. I don't know if I'm saying that backwards or not, but anyway, you, you get the point. So you can go back to that, 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 that genealogy. And so going back to Jesus' genealogy, you can see and find that he is from the tribe of Judah. He is from the tribe of Judah. And so now, because I've put my faith in Jesus, I now belong to that genealogy. I am now part of the lineage of Judah. What does Judah mean? Judah means praise. Judah means praise. So when you worship, when you release a sound of praise, when you worship, you not only confuse the enemy, but you remind them of what lineage you've been engrafted into because of the blood of Jesus. That's good news for someone today. Going back to the example, maybe you might walk into a room and you forget what you're going in, in there for, and then and you walk back out and you walk back in. You're like, oh, that, that's what I, that's what I came in there to do. Well, the enemy, whenever he walks into your life to try to cause chaos, whenever you start worshiping, he's uh, he's like, I, I don't know, I, I don't know what I'm doing here. I, I'm, I'm going to step out. But whenever he tries to come back in, then then he remembers, oh, hey, oh, they're they're part of this tribe, but they're part of this tribe. I, I gotta I gotta leave. So not only do you confuse the enemy, you remind him of what lineage you've been added onto because of Jesus. Amen. But how can you remind the enemy of something that you don't know? In any circumstance, in any circumstance, it doesn't matter what you're facing. It doesn't matter what you're going through. You don't praise conditionally. Don't praise with a mentality that is conditional. Praise with a mentality that you're going to praise constant, no matter what comes against your life. David said, I will bless the Lord all the time. His praise shall be what? Continually on my lips. We don't worship conditionally. We worship constantly. And so if you, if you look at the story, the end of it says that the men of Israelite wanted him and his son and, and the, his son's son to reign over the people of Israel. But what did Gideon do? No, he said, no, I'm not going to reign over you. Jesus is going to reign over you. God is going to reign over you. You're, you're, you're his people. It, it, he, Gideon knew that in that moment, it wasn't because of his efforts. It wasn't because of his, his strength. It certainly wasn't his 300 men. It was all because of the goodness and the mercy and the favor of God in his life. And the same is true for us today. You can't take any credit for anything that, that has happened, the blessing that you've been engrafted into, your salvation. You can't take any credit for that. It's simply the goodness and the mercy and the favor of God on your life. Amen. You have no idea. You have no idea what God can do with you depending on how you posture yourself in a moment of, break, of breaking. And say it again, you have no idea what the Lord can do through you, depending on how you posture yourself in a moment of breaking. Amen. That's all I got for you guys today. May I bless anybody? Amen. Glory to God. Glory to God. I want to invite our altar ministers to come up forth, come up front. And if you need prayer for any reason, I want you to step forth. If you need prayer for any reason, we're gonna say a quick prayer and then we'll be released. But 
in this moment, just wanted you to close your eyes, all, all eyes closed, all, all, all head bowed. We're about to finish, we're about to finish. Please don't be a disturbance sent to anyone else. This could be the moment of their salvation. What is it that you're facing right now? Give it over to the Lord. Right now in this moment of breaking, in this moment of breaking, God is saying, I am with you. I've never left you. I've never forsaken you. I am with you in this. I am with you in this. And you might say, God, but why, why am I facing this? Why am I dealing with this? Why is my relationship that way? Why am I struggling with this addiction? Why am I going through this? And God is saying, I, I've never left you. I've been with you all along. But I'm using this moment for you to turn back to me. You need to know who to come back to. You need to know who to turn to. When things go south, when things don't go the way that you've expected them to, you need to know who to come back to. You need to know in these moments that whenever you're obedient to God's voice, you're going to face opposition. Gideon faced it. He had opposition that came against him, but he didn't let that stop him from advancing the gospel. There's someone that needs to hear the word of God in your life. There's someone that needs to hear the message of Jesus. And tell you, I'll tell you what, even in this breaking point, depending on how you posture yourself, depending on how you posture yourself will determine where you stand after your breakthrough. The Lord is using this moment of breaking for his glory. He's using this moment of breaking for his glory. And all you have to do is trust. All you have to do is trust. All you have to do is surrender to his will. So Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you, Father, for your word that never returns unto you void. But Father, it goes forth and accomplishes everything that you've sent it to do. So God, I pray for those that are struggling right now, whether it be mentally, whether it be physically, whether it be emotionally, Father, relationally, Father, I pray, God, that your hand would be on them, God, and that you would remind them by your spirit, God, that you have never left them, you have never forsaken them, that you are with them right now, even in this moment of breaking. And God, that you would remind them that this moment will only be to bring you glory, Father. Whenever we, we position ourselves to, to say, Lord, you get the credit for this. You get the credit for this. I don't know why I'm dealing with this, but, but in the end, I know that it's going to bring you glory. Father, help us to have that mentality. And even through this moment of breaking, Father, help us to go back to worship. Help us to go back to praise, Father. Help us to re remind ourselves who we are, wh whose we are. And help us to confuse the enemy whenever something comes and attacks against us, Father, because we know that greater is he that is with us than he that is in the world. So, Father, I pray that you would remind us right now. Help us to walk with a conviction. Help us to walk with boldness. And I pray, Father, for those right now that haven't accepted you as Lord and Savior. Father, I pray right now that your Holy Spirit would just minister into their hearts and minds. And that they would leave this place differently than the way that they came in. Holy Spirit, do a work that only you can do. If you haven't accepted Jesus into your heart, now is the moment, now is the day. It's as simple as putting your faith in him. Whenever you put your faith in him, you are now the son, you are now the daughter of the most high king. And you now have your salvation. You have now been given eternal life. You've now been engrafted into a blessing that didn't belong to us in, in the first place. So give your life over to him right now. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your presence. And we just glorify you. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Can we give God praise in this place? Amen. 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 Well, church, if you need prayer for any reason, 
We still got altar ministers here at, at, at either cam campuses. If you need prayer for any reason, please come forward. There are a few announcements. Pastor will be back this Wednesday at 6.30. Bring yourself, bring a friend. They need to hear this, this word. He'll be back at 6.30. Wogum Espanol will be at the State Fair of Louisiana today. We're currently out there. There's uh, uh, current ministers that are praying and, and giving out Bibles and praying for uh, people that are there that need to hear the message of Jesus. If you want to come out and support, we will be leading worship from 3 to 4 p.m. Otherwise, we will see you Wednesday at 6.30. God bless you.